Hi, good to see you again. How are you? I'm good. Where'd you get that t-shirt? I got this. Actually, I wore this for you because I know this is retail slut on Melrose is where you got your top hat. I think we spoke about that last time I interviewed you, but they did a, a revival of it at Lethal Amounts where they they basically recreated the store with oh, no some of the old merchandise, old um they had like old mannequins. Uh, Tammy Down was there, you know, like people used to work at the store and stuff. It was really cool. And I bought really the shirt. Cool. So I bought the, I brought that for you. And I also have other props. I don't know if you remember Nagel. He's gotten bigger since we last. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, he's gotten he's a little bit cool. bigger. And, you know, it's take a son to work day, whatever he's here. So he's a, he's just going to kind of sit in and observe and stuff. <laughs> Um, honestly, I, I love your book, but I feel like I know you and I've talked snakes before you could do a book of snakes. Like, don't you have, you have 400 guitars, but I think you have quite a collection of snakes as well. I don't, don't, you? I don't now. I did. Uh -huh. I used to have an amazing collection of snakes, but I got rid of everything when, uh, when my first son was born because, mm. uh, you know, I, I had some, some hundred and some odds snakes and they were all big constrictors and stuff. And yeah, way I, bigger than that him. was a recipe for disaster. So yeah, yeah, maybe you could get little ones like this, but, you know, maybe having boa constrictors around the house is a bad I, idea. I was always a big snake guy, so, like, with big snakes. So I have one now in San Anaconda, and he's in a zoo in Nashville. Oh, wow, that's so cool. Does it say on the cage, like, this no, is donated not, by Slash? Or... He's not on display. He's just there for, for me, for them to take care of him for me. Because I'm always on the road, and there's no one at home that can do it. I see. Who was the snake in the patient's video? Um, we're was, actually coming up on the 35th anniversary of GNR Live, so I figured I might as well ask about that snake. Yeah, that was Pandora, and that was my boa constrictor, uh, who I had for years, and she was at the LA Zoo until she passed away. Oh, wow. You have, like, quite a collection of snakes that they end up in actual zoos, and I know. Yeah, but, but so you had a hundred and something snakes? Yeah, I had a massive, massive menagerie of, of snakes at home. Um and uh, that went on for years. I used to hire people to take care of them when I was gone. And mm -hmm. you know, all things considered, whenever you have somebody come and take care of reptiles, they're usually very interesting people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. We're you interesting know, people. They're, they're not your average babysitters. But um, anyway, over time, I started to realize that hiring strangers to come take care of my 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 loved ones doesn't really working out too much. So. Yeah. Well, along with your menagerie of, of snakes, you have an even bigger menagerie of guitars, which is the right. main reason we're here to talk about the book, The Collection, Gibson, The Collection Slash, which has uh, not all 400 of your guitars, but quite a few of your guitars. Yeah, most, most of them are in there. I mean, there's a lot of guitars in there. <laughs> so um, we don't have time to talk about all 400, but I figured we'd start with a lightning round of some of the highlights from the book. Yeah. Um, I'd love you to relay the story of your very first guitar, which if I'm not mistaken, if I read correctly, the only reason I don't have the book in front of me to hold it up is I'm not strong enough. It weighs more than a boa constrictor. It's like an 800 pound book. It's huge, but it's beautiful. Um, but when I was reading it, the first guitar you got had like one string on it or something like that. Yeah, it was a, a Spanish style acoustic guitar that my grandmother had tucked away in a closet. And, uh, and it, when I got it, it only had one string on it. And I started learning riffs on the one string. And I finally broke down and went to a local guitar school and learned how to put the other strings on it and started taking guitar lessons. But uh, that was that was my first guitar. I don't know where that is, sadly. Um, mm -hmm. There's a there's a small handful of guitars that I don't know where they disappeared to. That's actually interesting you said that because that was literally the next question I was going to ask is a lot of guitarists I speak to they have the one that got away. It could be one that was stolen, lost. Maybe they pawned it when they were needing money before they were famous or for other reasons, obviously. That but was my story. <laughs> tell me, yeah, what's your guitar that got away? Um, well, I mean, let's see. There was a, there was a guitar that was called, uh, affectionately called the Hunter Burst, which was one of the uh, Max guitars, which is a, uh, a handmade uh, Les Paul 59 replica, basically. Mm -hmm. And I had that in the early days of Guns N' Roses. Um, and that was a great Les Paul that used to belong to Steve Hunter, who played in Alice Cooper. Anyway, and, uh, uh, and that guitar, along with a few others, got pawned 
or you know something like that when i was when i was in need of money for other things and it was just during a period where you know anyway so there was a few guitars that went by the wayside and that was the main one that i and i actually know where that guitar is now somebody actually acquired it and uh and i actually saw it he uh one of the guitar broker friends of mine a guy named albert molinero brought the guitar over to rehearsal because he knows the guy that owned it and said the guy would be willing to sell it back to you but it was like really ridiculously expensive and i was like i'm not, sure. not even gonna go there oh that's too bad so i'm obviously many other guitars and this might be asking you like asking someone like who their favorite child is or who their favorite snake is but do you have when push comes to shove a favorite guitar that if it, you were on like a sinking ship or a burning house and you could just grab one what would it be well I'd, I'd have to say that the another handmade 59 replica that i used to record appetite for destruction with which was a guitar that was made by uh, a late luthier um chris derrick and that guitar has been my go-to recording guitar and just like that's sort of my comfort zone guitar and has been for I guess whatever how long how long it's been 35 years or something 40 uh, yeah. and uh if so you know if, if puss came to shove that would be one guitar i would rely on you know you did mention that you had um a, a guitar i almost said snake a guitar with that was affectionately named what was it hunter the hunter burst yeah a hunter burst but you have some other affectionate names for guitars that are mentioned in the book what's the story about how you have a guitar named jessica and then there's little Jess, her sister. Like, is so, was it named after a woman in your life? Uh, no, I don't even remember how she ended up becoming Jessica. And the other one, little Jess, is actually Stephanie. But my guitar tech likes to call her little Jess because she's the sister. You know, like the the I got those two guitars at the same time. Anyway, but I don't know where the name Jessica came from. It's just something that you know, I it's she just has been named Jessica for decades. So we're talking about anniversaries and I mentioned, you know, I mentioned patience in the context of snakes, but I mentioned that, yeah, it is 35 years ago this year that GNR Lives came out. I mean, obviously, you know, the live portion of it had been recorded like even before Appetite, but when that came out as a, as a package. And um, so that kind of, you know, that was the acoustic side of, of you, of what you do, which, you know, coming off of an album like Appetite maybe surprised some people. Do you have any memories of sort of, you're wanting to show off your acoustic chops at it that was, time. Actually, to tell you the truth, that wasn't the kind of record that we really planned out. We had released Appetite and we were touring on it and we had some songs and they were just like, we always played on acoustic a lot. A lot of Appetite songs were written just hanging around jamming on acoustic. So we had some songs that were written on acoustic and we actually just recorded them as is on acoustic. They were really acoustic songs, to be honest. And so we just went into a studio and, and banged them out really quickly. They were very spontaneous and, and one take kind of things. So it was very loose. There wasn't a lot of, a lot of big plans for that. Um, you know, if we're talking about, and I've talked about this with, with, with Duff as well, like just looking back at it incredibly like 35 later, you know, obviously a big thing that kind of overshadowed that release was the one in a million controversy, which people kind of took that song literally and didn't realize what Axel meant. I mean, do you look back on it and think like, wow, if the internet had existed then or social media had existed, then we would, Guns N' Roses would have gone canceled, you know, because mm -hmm. of, of how that would have traveled even faster than it did then. Yeah, I actually haven't thought about it in that context. I mean, I really, to be honest, I haven't really thought about all that that much recently. But now that you mention it, most of everything that we did would have gotten this canceled in this day and age. Um, we would not have fared well in this environment, for sure. I mean, on, on so many different levels, right? Um, but that's just, you know, I mean, a lot of things from back then would not um be a, what you considered uh acceptable at this moment in time like what other ones would you s suggest i mean i could certainly i i would think and i've talked about duff with this one as well it's so easy i think might have been one that um oh, as far as uh, so far as songs are concerned or just oh. in general what what cancelable things have would you could you cite where you're like glad that happened in 87 or 88 and not you know now or whatever you know what i can't put my finger on a specific thing because it's pretty much all of it 
<laughs> have you ever looked back on on those years and obviously some of the stuff doesn't age well other things it's like oh that was a simpler time but do you ever think like god i'm really glad Guns i'm just Roses glad that we didn't have the internet back then <laughs> would have been a different world altogether you know? yeah. but anyway i don't dwell on all that stuff it's just you know it it is it is what it is but you did mention it so yeah the only reason i mentioned it is because we're obviously talking about um you know i mentioned the anniversary of of g in our lives but there's a there's a another mm -hmm. i actually <laughs> what's up i didn't even know that well it's so in I, november but it's this I, year 1988 and uh, -huh. uh but there's also another anniversary um I don't know. It's the anniversary this year, I believe, of or not to of uh, the would it be I guess the thirtieth anniversary of what was the last studio album that the that Guns N' Roses ever did, which is the Spaghetti Incident. Is it? Um, night was that ninety two or ninety three? I have no idea. Somewhere in there. <laughs> so I'm curious about what memories you have of that because it's kind of interesting. You know, obviously Guns N' Roses have been back and touring for about five or so years now, but that was your last studio album, and it was a covers record, which yeah. you know. That was another throw and go. It was just done for the fun of it, and it was done all over the place. It was done in different studios um, around the country because we were on the road at the time. So it was a very sort of haphazard, fun roll into some unsuspecting studio in the middle of the night and just show up there with some gear and say, hey, we'd like to book some time and go in there and bang one or two of these songs out. So, you know, that's that was that was really sort of the way the whole record was made. Well, it's interesting because it was coming off a previous studio album, which had been which just celebrated anniversary last year and had a reissue like a lot of anniversaries with you guys, uh, mm -hmm. which was Use Your Illusion. And that was a double record. So I'm curious about when you followed that up, why it was a covers record. Had you sort of like, because the previous album had been a double record, you sort of like gone through all your original material you had in the can or? No, it wasn't that. It was just because we had all these songs that we liked and we would jam certain ones at gigs and this and that and the other. And we just had the idea to put them together and record them. I'm a very big Hound Our Rocks fan. Didn't you record Beer and a Cigarette, but it didn't come out? Will it come out? Uh, I don't recall. I read that. Um, I think I would remember that, but there's, okay. you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a faint possibility that that happened, but not that I can recall. According yeah. to Wikipedia, it did happen, but that it yeah. never came out. So I was hoping that maybe that would end up on, you know. Yeah, I have to I, now. Now I have to. I have to go talk to Duff and see if he remembers anything about that. Well, let me um, ask you about some other stuff of, on Wikipedia about that record specifically, and you can tell me if Wikipedia is wrong because it's not always right. But you know, I'm talking about the spaghetti incident. Um, I had read that you know things were kind of fraught in the GNR camp at that time, which was why you did this kind of more light-hearted project to sort of like alleviate whatever tension may have been going on. Is is there any truth to that? Uh, wait, so, so, so wait, say that again. The, so the, the spaghetti incident, which was a covers record, which oh, you oh, have oh. mentioned, it was kind of loose and kind of see of the pants that it was sort of like things were kind of weird in the camp at the time. And this was sort of something that was done as like either a bonding exercise or just something where like there wasn't as much pressure to uh, duplicate the success of, the previous two albums was, there, was, there was no uh real forethought you're way, taking it way way too seriously well wikipedia um, is no yeah, yeah i don't read <laughs> i well actually that's not true i have read wikipedia about different things but not about us um but yeah there was there was not a lot of uh there was not a lot of forethought going into that record it was just something that we just did for the fun of it okay well looking back on um certain guitars that are in this book and um you know obviously that we're used to be on all of these albums that we're talking about what is the one that like what's your favorite solo I've, i mean i'm sure you've been asked that before but i've never asked you that what is your favorite guitar solo oh uh, yeah i have and the, what I, guitar do you use for it I to write it have, but i just don't have one um because what happens is, you know, you have different guitar solos for different songs and, and you know, whatever it is that you're doing is supposed to speak to that particular song. So I don't have a, a favorite guitar solo. 
Okay. They're all their own thing, you know. Is there one? I don't imagine solos are very hard for you because you know you're an expert in this, as that I believe Geico commercial showed. Uh, but the uh, is there one that is hardest for you? Was hardest for you to write? Is hardest for you to do live to recreate live? Right. Um, oh fuck. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I put, you know, it's, it's, you know, on any given night, um, a, a solo really has to mean something for you in the moment. And you do a lot of songs in a show and trying to find the right feel for that particular song in the moment in every song during the set is sort of a mixed bag. You don't know what's going to happen. So certain, certain solos uh, really fucking, have an emotional feel on a given night and sometimes they don't have that then that could be any particular song so i can't say one particular solo is always harder than another it just depends on what the vibe is that night for which, whatever song you know all right well the last question i'm going to ask oh i'm sorry go ahead i know i say it's an ambiguous answer but that's the best i can do it's it's all good i'm you know one question i mean i was going into so much anniversary stuff and memories of guitars anniversaries of records but i want to go all the way back up to the beginning for my last question i'm sort of asking the questions in reverse order because this is something i actually didn't know and i learned from your book i knew about who your mother was and i knew but i did not realize that you spent the first six years of your life in london or in england right mm -hmm. And um, I didn't, I mean, I didn't realize you'd spent that much time there. That's kind of like formative time. I know you're six is still young, but it's it's old enough to no, I, remember. What was that like? And I mean, was there British music that really kind of influenced you like as early core memories? Um, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I loved living in England. I, I missed it when I left and I was really sad, you know, as a kid when I left because I was attached, you know. Um, but uh, the great thing about, living in it was in stoke and trent is where I, mm. um was that my my dad and my uncles were massive rock and roll fans like hardcore get the record and listen to it you know intently at, at full volume and so so i mean i got turned on to the who i got turned on to the stones i got turned on to the moody blues i got turned on to pink floyd and the yardbirds and all that stuff was what was happening at that time jimmy hendrix so, um, you know, I just, I was weaned on really great British rock and roll from, from my inception. <laughs> yeah. And your, your mother, the, the stylist was, she was like the stylist to a lot of those British rock stars. Do you have, I mean, obviously, you know, I believe you and I've talked about David Bowie before, but do you have any memories of, again, core memories where you were introduced to certain rock stars that made you think, I want to do that when I grow up. Well, you know, there was a lot of people around. We were living in Laurel Canyon, right? And it mm -hmm. was 1971 or whatever. So there was, we worked with, uh, I, they, I, we worked, they worked with Joni Mitchell and, and a lot of David Geffen artists or David Crosby, who just passed away. But, you knew uh, David Crosby? Yeah, all those people were all in the canyon and all, it was a very communal environment. Um, and so we used to spend a lot of time at the Tributor and recording studios around town. So I was I was really um, taken with the setup of the gear, you know, before the show started and that whole, you know, seeing everything and then the actual show itself. But I had no aspirations to actually be a musician. It sort of stumbled. I sort of stumbled into it, you know, um, but I was a huge fan of the whole process. And I love to go to recording studios and watch, like, like say, Joni um, doing her thing. It was an amazing experience for me. But I didn't know that I was going to be a musician. So all of a sudden, I just happened to pick up the guitar. Do you have any memories before I let you go? I mean, Joni's totally in the news because she's having this whole research yeah. now. David Crosby, sadly, in the news, you know, yeah. because he passed last week. Do you have any real core memories of meeting any of, you know, I imagine David Crosby was an interesting guy to know. His right. name. Um, I have, I have great memories of just being around, you know, cause I'm a little kid. So I'm just sort of like a piece of furniture, but just being around everybody hanging out smoking a lot of weed and, and being really, really creative and everybody being like, I, I the, for the best, for want of a better word, super cool. 
everybody was really laid back and everybody was really cool and everybody was really intelligent which is a little bit different than the sort of picture of rock and roll that we think of you know um these these uh all these people were very very much uh very educated and um had a very sort of clear perspective on what they wanted and what they wanted to do and super super creative so it was it was really great for me to have been around that even though i didn't know what i was taking in at the time looking back on it well it's interesting to me that you didn't necessarily originally realize that that was going to be your path because it seems like between your up, early upbringing in in england and then you know your little canyon upbringing and, and just being around all this by osmosis it was kind of destined to be but the last question i'll ask you to sort of bring it back to guzzy roses you mentioned the troubadour and kind of being exposed to that early through the Laurel Canyon thing. Can you sum up what it meant for you that the troubadour became so important in, in, I mean, that's where Guns N' Roses basically got signed. Um, yeah. Full circle moment for you. Um, I mean, I've always, the, the troubadour probably has a more special place in my heart than, you know, other venues only because that was the one that I went to the most when I was younger. And it hasn't really changed that much. I was around when Doug Weston was still around, who was a very odd character. But, uh, you know, I just, I went to a lot of shows there as a kid. And then uh, going and playing the first, even before Guns N' Roses, the first band that I ever played in with Axel, which was Holly Rose, was at the Troubadour. Um, first gig that we ever did together was at the Troubadour. So it has a, it has a real indelible history in, in my career, you know. Awesome. And uh, the history of your career in the book, uh, the collection slash, it's an amazing history told your life basically told through guitars. the history of guitars, which is so, the perfect memoir for you. So thank you so much for taking the time. Nagel thanks you as well. He's a little, um, he's a little starstruck because you're like, you know, snake royalty, but thank you for, oh, well, thank you as someone who from the patient's video to say that he takes that compliment very seriously. So right. thank you so much. It was really wonderful to speak with you again. You have a wonderful day, Slash. You too. It was good talking to you. Good Cheers. talking to you too. Bye. Bye.